All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. We got most everyone here. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, this session, uh, we're going to be talking about the go kart electrical system. Uh, my name is Nate Croft. Uh, I work with a company called Bay 4 Technical Services. I'm an engineer. Um, we work mainly in uh, solar power plants. Um, so that's, that's my background. Um, this session, uh, for those of you guys see a few familiar faces from the one earlier today, uh, it'll be about uh, maybe half overlap between that one and then we'll get more specifically into um, the, the actual components you'll be using in your go-kart and um, how to work with those and how to wire them up and, and, and hook them up. So there's a little bit of overlap from before, so uh, hopefully you can bear with me through that and then we'll get more specifically into the, um, the, the actual components and, and the ratings and uh, how to look at those up and all that stuff. So, um, so let's dive right in. Um, feel free to ask questions throughout at any point. I'm happy to take those. Um, okay, so uh, what we want to get out of the session today, what I, what I want to talk to you about and hopefully impart is um, the, how to think about the whole system of what, the, the whole electrical system of your go-kart, um, how those components work together, how they fit together, how they're wired together, um, how one interacts with the other, um, how you provide power. Uh, from your, your module um, on top of your carts uh, to the motor to, to push the cart, to, to move it forward, um, and how you control each of those things. Um, so that's the, the goal here uh, for, this, for this one. So just to start off, um, to get us all on the same page, I want to um, talk about units and conventions that we talk about with electricity um, and, and our circuits. Um, so voltage is measured in volts. Current is measured in amps. Um, voltage is the potential energy. Um, it's a characteristic of your batteries. Um, it's uh, um, um, the potential energy that things can operate at. Um, current is the amount of charge uh, that can flow through something or, or that does flow through a circuit. Um, and that's measured in amps, number of amps. Resistance is a function of your loads. Um, it's a function of the things in your circuit. Do you have a voltage source? Um, say your PV module or your battery um, and then that will go through your circuit through your wires through your lows through your motor um, and there's resistance associated with each of those things with the wires with the, the different loads if you think of a basic circuit with a light bulb in it um, the light bulb has a certain amount of resistance so we talk about that in terms of ohms um, and then those uh, current voltage and resistance are um, all related in terms of uh, the equation V equals IR. You guys are probably familiar with that, I've heard that. So the voltage is a product of your current and resistance. Um, those three are all interrelated. You change any one of them and it affects the other two within a circuit. Um, then power is uh, measured in watts. It is a function of the voltage and current that you're operating at. Um, so watts, um, your power equals the product of your voltage and your current, and power is instantaneous. So it's at a certain amount of time, a certain point in time, what voltage is your circuit operating at and what current is flowing through that, that's your power. Energy is power over time, and we measure that in watt hours typically. Um, you can do watt seconds, um, it's basically power times time, so it could be watt minutes, um, watt hours is the, the basic convention, and that is the amount of power you supply instantaneously, um, but then over amount of time. So if I can supply, say, uh, 50 watts for an hour, then I've supplied 50 watt hours of energy. So uh, voltage is a potential energy. Uh, potential energy causes something uh, to happen if provided a means. Um, so you have a voltage source like a battery. Um, you hook that up to a circuit and that energy will power the things in the circuit um, based on uh, the, the voltage energy of that battery. Um, batteries have both a voltage level and a capacity for charge. So you guys in your carts have, um, I think, four six volt batteries. And um, each one of those batteries has a characteristic voltage level, which is its potential energy at six volts. So it's fully charged, um, it had, each one has six volts. You end up hooking those up in series, so you wire one to the other, 
um, and those voltage levels sum so that you end up having uh, an equivalent of a 24 volt battery. Um, so, so, and that voltage is characteristic of the battery, right? Batteries also have a capacity for charge. So each one of those batteries may have some amount of energy that at full charge it can supply. Um, it might be 10 watt hours, say. Um, so, uh, you, and that would be in one of them. When you hook them up like you're gonna do, or you add, you hook them up in series, uh, one hooked up to the other, the voltages add, and then so do the, um, the energies. So you have 10 watt hours in one, you have four, you'll have 40 watt hours. Um, and that's the capacity of, of, of holding charge in those batteries. Um, battery level, um, when you run it, when you hook it up and, and supply uh, power through a battery, uh, that capacity drops over time. Um, and uh, you might start with a fully charged battery at 10 watt hours, supply 10 watts for 30 minutes, and then you're left with five watt hours to do whatever's next. Um, so just wanna introduce there the idea. Uh, here is a diagram of how you will hook up your batteries um, in order to get that functionality where the voltages add um, where you hook the negative side of the battery uh, or the positive side up to the negative side of one of the other batteries so that overall you have a negative side and a positive side coming out of your battery bank. So you have, say, six volts across this, these two terminals and another six volts across these two terminals. That gives you a total of 12 volts across those terminals. Right? So you'll hook up four of these like this and have 24 volts battery with a certain amount, a certain capacity for uh, energy when they're fully charged. So when you run a battery, um, uh, I wanna introduce you here to a concept called a, um, uh, the relationship between current and, and voltage in what's called an IV curve um, or an IV chart. Um, when you run a battery, uh, your current changes with the resistance in the circuit so V equals IR, right? Um, so your current might be something along on this side of the chart. Um, your, your voltage pretty much stays the same. Um, there's a slight drop off on a real battery, but for all practical purposes, we talk about that voltage as, as staying the same. Um, so you, know, you have a 12 volt battery. Um, as you run it, when it, if it's at, you can think of it, if it's at 10, in, or 10 watt hours, um, fully charged, you run it down to half charge. Um, no matter what the current is, your, your voltage is gonna kinda stay relatively the same. Um, there's small differences, and that gets into more advanced stuff about how you measure the charge of a battery based on those, those small differences, but for all intents and purposes and for you guys, as you can think of those batteries having a small voltage. So solar panels are slightly different. In your system, you need to get your solar panel to interact with your battery in order to power your motor, right? So um, you can't just hook them directly up to each other. Um, and it's because solar panels work in a slightly different way. Uh, so in a basic sense, solar panels work because um, when they are in light, it provides a voltage. Um, and so then you have a solar panel, which has a, a potential difference across the terminals, the positive and negative terminals of the solar panel. Um, so here, so I put this in sunlight, and I've got a certain amount of voltage here. Now that voltage can be used like a battery. You can hook it up to a circuit and you know, drive current um, and can uh, run electrical systems. However, solar panels don't have that straightforward relationship between current and voltage that, that batteries have. Um, and it's, it's much more variable. Solar panel voltages vary depending on the weather conditions, whether it's a sunny day, whether it's a cloudy day. Um, current depends on those conditions as well. The voltage and current also changes depending on the circuit. So in a battery, you hook a battery up to a circuit, um, you have a pretty much set voltage, um, and your current's gonna depend on the resistance in that circuit, but that voltage isn't gonna, you can, you can know what that voltage is. Um, solar panels are, are different. The, the voltage and the current that, the, that is coming out of that solar panel is gonna change depending on the characteristics of your circuit. So the point of all that is that 
uh, like I said, you can't hook a solar panel directly up to a battery. So you have to have something in between, some other control system there um, to allow them to interact. Um, this is sort of what I was getting at with the fact that the solar panels and batteries um, operate quite differently. This is the equivalent IV curve of a solar panel. So as you can see, um, you know, on the battery one, we were talking about, you know, depending on where your current is, your, your voltage pretty much is a straight line. Solar panels are different. Um, as your current changes, as my current goes up, depending on the circuit, uh, my voltage can drop significantly. Um, and so, you know, you can't directly charge a battery off of a solar panel because it's hard to predict what that voltage is going to be. Um, and batteries need to be charged at a certain voltage level and a certain current, or else you could damage the battery, um, and it's just not efficient. So because of that, because you can't really predict, because it's really hard to predict where you're operating at, um, you need what's called a battery charge controller. Anytime you have a, a solar panel hooked up to a, a battery, basically anytime you have a solar panel hooked up to any load, you need some sort of electronic device that's managing where it's operating. And so at a solar power plant, um, one of those big power plants or, or the carports that you see um, around town, anything like that, um, you always have a piece of electronics um, that is controlling where on this curve, how much current and voltage is that so that it can hold it steady so that when conditions change you don't get wild variations and things like that um, so that's kind of the idea there um, being like so uh, why do we have the charge controller back in our original um, why do we have this piece of equipment in here and the reason is to hook up the, the module to the battery you need some <coughs> other piece of electronics in there. Um, and so, um, then all of that, so you have power coming from your uh, PV module, going through a charge controller, which is managing what voltage and current that module is operating um, so that it can properly charge the battery and supply current to your circuit. Um, that's going into your batteries, which um, will, will probably, you know, you might charge them um, ahead of the race, or you might just allow the solar to charge them. It'll probably be at, um, close to a full charge when you start your race in the go-kart. Um, all that needs to power a motor. So um, this is uh, just an example of uh, what your motors might look like in your system. Um, this might be the same motor. This is a couple years old. I don't know if they've changed it, but... Um, this uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go through the components of the system and start talking about you know what are the different characteristics of each of the components and how do they how do they work together? Do they operate at the same voltage? That's a, a basic question to ask for your circuit, right? Um, does your electrical system is it all compatible in terms of voltage? So we know that the batteries we talked about are 24 volts, right? So it's a good idea to check with the motor and make sure that that will operate at the 24 volts um, that you're trying to power it with, right? Um, and in this case, you can look on the, um, the system here and it says it operates at 24 volts. Perfect. In this case, you know, you guys are um, in your carts given a set of components. So the idea is that they all are interoperable and, and are going to work well together. But in any other cases, if you're doing your own electrical design, uh, own systems, you always want to make sure, you know, what if you had um, a 36 volt battery and we're trying to power this motor? Um, what are the kind of implications of that? Maybe it won't, or maybe it's unsafe. Maybe the motor might burn out. Maybe you need something in between the high battery, high voltage battery and the motor to step down the voltage to the motor's operating voltage. So um, you have to make sure that kind of all your systems are, are operable and interconnected. Um, other things you can learn about your motor from this sheet um, would be the power outputs. Um, you can see the current that it will take in. Um, the rated current is 26.7 amps. Um, in your systems, there's basically no way you'll be able to supply that much current um, to the motor uh, unless you just completely short circuit your uh, 
uh, your batteries and everything might burn up and fry before you got to that point anyway. Um, but in other, in other cases, you want to make sure that the current you're trying to supply to your motor actually fits with what it's rated for, right? Um, otherwise, it may not operate efficiently. It may be in danger of breaking. You may run into other things. So anytime you're troubleshooting a system, anytime you have problems, if you're building an electronic system, um, always double check that everything is um, rated to be operating at the currents and voltages that you're trying to operate it at. Um, this also gives you an idea of uh, the, the um, efficiency of the system uh, or of the motor itself. Uh, so how much you know, of the power, the electrical power that you put into it that it then translates into physical power is only ever going to be 78% of that. So you're automatically with your motor losing some efficiency. Um, so uh, in terms of design and when you're thinking about you know, how much voltage and current am I trying to get out of my system to make my cart go as fast as possible, um, what you put into the motor is not necessary. Is not the power that you get out of it. So you're automatically going to lose, you know, 22% of your energy at the motor. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about uh, uh, any anytime you're doing electrical design, um, where how much power you're you're trying to get into one thing versus what's coming out of it. And what's in it. So your system, um, your components, uh, like I said. Are, are all been supplied. They're all compatible, um, but you have to put them together in the correct way in order to make them compatible. Um, you have probably about a 36 volt solar panel. Um, like I said, you can't plug that directly into a 24 volt battery. You have to have a charge controller in the middle. Um, that charge controller needs to supply a little more than 24 volts in order to charge the battery. If you had a charge controller in between your panel and your battery that output 20 volts, you're never going to charge your battery, right? So you can't just put any charge controller into that system. You have to be intentional and make sure things uh, work together well. Um, uh, your battery, so you might have 50 watt hour capacity. Um, I, maybe the, maybe each of these six volt batteries has a 12.5 watt hour uh, capacity, so you know, 50 watt hours. This can be used to try and figure out how long your cart could run. You know, if you just want to get out to the racetrack and run the cart all the way, drain the batteries down, well, if you know that you have 50 watt hours of capacity and you can figure out the voltage that you're running your motor at and the current that is going to be put through, which is depending on your throttle, depending on how fast you run the motor, will be how much current you put through, then you can figure out how long you could go by just figuring out what power am I going to supply to the motor based on my voltage and current? Well, then I have 50 watt hours, so maybe I'm supplying 25 watts to my motor. Well, I could run for two hours, right? So um, you can use these electrical characteristics of your system to figure out how they're all going to operate together in terms of translating your car, or your cart, into a successful racer, right? You want to run it at a really high current, really high speeds. Um, you might win the fastest cart, but you might burn through that 50 watt hour capacity really fast. Maybe there's a speed at which um, you can maximize kind of the, the difference between both, where you can still go fast, but you're still being efficient enough to make the 50 watt hours that you have last a long time. That kind of idea. Um, uh, and so, yeah, you have the, the motor at its maximum current and voltage outputs 500 watts. I don't think, again, you won't have any chance of reaching that. I think if I remember correctly, um, and I could be wrong, but it's something in the range of like 170 watts is like the max output you're going to get out of your motors based on the, the system that you're on. Um, but, you know, a more advanced design, uh, if you guys have been doing this for a couple of years, any of the teams that have been doing this for, for one or two or three years, you might want to start thinking about um, not just hooking everything up so that it works together, but hooking everything up so that you are intentionally knowing how much watts you're putting into your motor and how much you're getting out of it or what your plan is and what's the best way to operate the cart to, to maximize those efficiencies, right? That's how you're going to win. 
that and a lot of your mechanical design and, and things like that. But in terms of just the electrical design, it will be in terms of knowing how all these things operate together and knowing how to get the most amount of power out of your panels and batteries into the motor um, for the longest amount of time. Uh, one thing I want to mention is fuses. Um, fuses are a very important part of your circuit. Um, it's a safety feature. Everyone's required to have fuses in it. Um, fuses, uh, you, I think you have to have them at certain spots within it. So make sure you read the rules. Know where your fuses need to be. Um, know, try to be, um, you have to pick what size of fuses you want. So what fuses do, if you're not familiar, um, is they protect against overcurrent. So if you've um, plugged, you know, wired something up wrong, say you've accidentally wired your um, uh, your your batteries directly into, um, say you've you've accidentally wired the battery positive terminal directly into the negative terminal. Somewhere down the line, you crisscross the wires, and, and now you have a short circuit between your battery, positive and negative. If you don't have any protection, that battery is just going to try and push as much current through the circuit as it can, and it will fry up, and there might be a safety hazard. Right? You might either you're going to just at the worst or at the best case, you'll damage the battery and have to get a new one. Worst case, you might actually you know have a fire hazard. If you have a fuse in that line, in that circuit, the fuse will break. Um, open up the path to that circuit, it'll blow and stop the current flowing before anything worse happens, right? So the fuse is the destructive part that um, blows and opens the circuit before you damage anything else or cause a safety hazard. So you'll see fuses in the, the <coughs> diagrams and things like that. You want to have them as part of your diagram. Um, that's the symbol for them. So just wanted to give you an idea about that. So this is a chart um, straight from the competition uh, guidelines, the, your rule book. Um, so this is, these are all of your electrical components in your system. If you haven't seen this before, I recommend reading the, um, the guidelines. I wanted to give a quick introduction to what each of these is. Um, so like we've talked about the solar panel, um, uh, you'll get one of those. You have a motor, um, and this gives you a bunch of information about it, it's uh, 24 volts, uh, operates at 250 RPM, rated current is 27.4 amps, output is 500 watts, um, so uh, that gives you an idea about the motor, like we looked at that page before about how to translate all those into how it operates. You have a motor controller, so we haven't talked uh, yet in this uh, presentation about the motor controller, I'll get more in depth on that in a little bit, um, but what the motor controller does is it takes the current and uh, the power from your modules and your battery to um, and, and allows you to control the amount of current that's going to the motor. Uh, if you just took the motor directly up to your voltage source, um, that's just going to want to run. Um, as soon as you hook it up, it's going to want to turn on and it's going to want to run as fast as possible. And you cannot operate a go-kart under those conditions um, unless uh, you're, you're kind of uh, uh, looking for trouble, right? So you need something in the system that will allow you to control the speed of your cart, that will allow you to tell it to turn off, to turn on, um, that kind of thing, without actually physically unhooking wires and hooking them back in. That's what your motor controller does. Same thing with all the other components. It needs to operate at the same voltage as everything else. Um, if you had your 24-volt system and had a motor controller that was rated for 12 volts, you were probably going to damage the motor controller if you try and put it into that system. And then you've broken a piece and, and it won't work. So again, stressing the idea of making sure that your components are um, interoperable at the conditions that you're trying to operate them at. Um, the wattage for this controller is 1,000 watts. That's great. Um, it will probably doesn't have a lower end range. Um, and so that is within our, our system. If you had a controller that was 24 volts but 100 watts, it might work in your system, right? You could plug it in, uh, you won't have any damage to it, but all of a sudden your cart won't go very fast. And you'd be, you'd be trying to figure it out, and maybe it's because you've got the wrong motor controller. The motor controller can only ever output 100 watts. Um, 
can operate at, a, at 24 volts and will current limit to 100 watts if it, if it was a 100 watt motor controller. So that would be a, a system that works, but your cart won't go very fast, and so you you know you won't do well in the competition. You guys are being given a motor controller, um, so you don't have to worry about that. But again, the idea of in, in doing electrical design, um, you want to make sure that, that things will work together and not break, but also that they'll perform the function that you want them to perform. You get two watt meters. Um, this is the kind of specifications of that, and I'll, I'll go into that in uh, more detail as well. The watt meters measure the power at the part of the system that they're in. Um, so one of the challenges of the competition will be deciding where you want to put the watt meters. Um, I don't think it's ever specifically told. There's a there's a um, there's an idea where they're the, the best place for them is to be, um, and uh, where you'll you'll actually get useful information out of them. Um, but maybe you want to put them somewhere else. Maybe you want to um, get different information out of it. So I'll talk a little bit more of that. Um, later, but, but what it does is it measures the power. So you might want to measure the power coming out of your module, like your PV module, um, and then you might want to measure the power coming out of your batteries to make sure that, you know, or, or going into the batteries, say, to make sure that the power from the module going to the charge controller is what's coming out of it, something like that. You might want to measure the power coming out of your PV module and the power going into your motor, and that would be at a different placement in your circuit um, for the watt meter. Um, so that g it gives you a lot of information about what's actually happening in your system while it's operating. Um, like I said, you get batteries. You get four new um, six volts, uh, 4.5 amp hour uh, lead acid batteries, um, and uh, you get four new adjustable. And uh, those will be hacked hooked up. And you get a charge controller. Um, that's that specification there. Uh, that charge controller, like we talked about, is what goes between the module and your batteries and makes that work. Um, quick idea here about the flow of electricity. When you're thinking about hooking all these things together, what you want to be thinking about is where is my electricity going from the positive end of the module into the positive end of the battery, um, into the positive end of the motor, and back through the negative end of everything. Like Think about that circuit, that whole circuit. From, from positive to negative. Um, this is just the, a simple circuit here, but if you're new to electrical design, um, this is kind of a, a starting point where you have a battery um, and it's supplying a current. It's got a voltage, like we talked about. Supplying a current through a circuit and powering a light bulb, right? So that's at its basic sense, that's what you want to think about. Now, what you guys will be doing is you will have something over here charging the battery and the battery will be powering a motor, and in between that you'll have a charge controller, and you'll have a motor controller, but the general idea remains, right? You want to be thinking about the pathway for the electricity. Um, one quick uh, hang-up that sometimes gets confusing, especially uh, if you're new to electrical design, um, charges flow opposite a current. We haven't talked about charges much in this session, um, but, but current is the flow of charges. Um, you have uh, electrons moving from, uh, you know, uh, through a wire, and that's what actually provides your power to something, is that, that movement of electrons and then going from a higher voltage state to a lower voltage state. Be careful. The actual electrons, uh, in reality, flow from the negative voltage to a positive voltage. By convention, because we like to think of numbers in terms of positive is higher than negative. Conventionally, we say that positive is a higher voltage than the negative end, and that current flows from high voltage to low voltage. So the current, when I talk about you know the current flowing in this circuit, um, and I'm thinking about the direction of it, <coughs> I, it goes from negative to po or from positive to negative. But in reality, that means that electrons are flowing that opposite direction. Because electrons are negatively, negatively charged, and they want to go to a positive source. So just don't get hung up on that, because um, it could be confusing if, if you're thinking interchangeably about current and electron flow. They're actually opposite. Um, 
just another uh, simple diagram of uh, pathways for electricity. A battery um, wired up uh, across wires with a resistor. It could be a load, that could be a battery, it could be a light with an on-off switch. Um, you're going to want to diagram your system out um, in terms of when you're thinking about how all those components are, are uh, hooked together. Uh, so you want to use conventional symbols. So I just wanted to give an introduction to the symbols that everyone might see in designs for a module for a solar panel or a PV module uh, for the battery, for the motor, for the fuse, for the switch. Um, so when you're when you're putting things in a diagram, which is a, a something you'll have to do for the design, you'll want to you know use symbols for that as you draw them out. Uh, here's a couple examples of the everything hooked together. So in the beginning I showed you this one up here which is your PV module, hooked to your charge controller, hooked to your battery, hooked to your motor control, hooked to your motor. Um, this is a more sophisticated model that actually shows the positive and negative sides. So this is much easier to translate into actual hooking things in to each other because I know that I have a wire going from positive through a fuse to positive end of the controller versus this one where I don't exactly know what the designer intends for the positive and negative. You, you have to have two wires in reality to make that connection. So this shows the two wires. Um, if you get more in-depth information about everything that's going on here in the more sophisticated diagram. So in doing your design and thinking about how everything fits together, uh, you might start with something simple like this and end with something more sophisticated like this. Um, when you're looking at and when you're doing your diagrams, um, some quick ideas about guidelines. Uh, you only want to use straight lines. You only want them to be vertical or horizontal. Don't use curves. Um, all this is to make the build process easier. So the clearer your drawings can be, the easier your build process is going to be. Um, you can color code. Um, you can add information like wire type and size. I'll just give you a couple examples of, of um, some drawings from past years. Uh, here's one here, color-coded, um, everything's a straight line, it's always vertical um, or horizontal, there's no diagonals, which would make things really confusing. Everything's labeled, so you guys will be working with this. Um, and this just shows, you know, we've talked about the individual components, really important how they all hook together in terms of wiring. Um, here's another example. Um, they've got some more information here, um, tell you what size the wire should be, um, what the fuse size is, color-coded. Um, you know, this is an interesting example of they put the battery instead of this one. Everything, you know, voltage is, is up, negative is, or positive is up, negative is down on this one, which kind of gives it uh, a, a nice way to um, understand it throughout the whole drawing. Uh, in this one they flipped it over. Makes it a little bit more confusing maybe because now you've got positive on the left and negative on the right. It's a little different but you can still as long as it's, it's labeled you can still figure out. So I want to get back to um, for the uh, next part of this presentation talking about each one of these components in turn. Um, my advice is to Look up these components online. Look for user manuals. Look for directions for how they're wired. Um, my job, it's always way easier. A lot of my job is like looking for the manufacturer's guidelines. A lot of times that they tell you exactly how to wire them up. Um, so do a little bit of extra research. Google is great. Just Google those um, these names of things, you know, you can just plug that into Google and it'll take you right to the web page of where that watt meter is sold and it'll tell you how to hook it up and I'll actually show it to you. Um, and it, it can make your lives a lot easier. So, um, specifically the components that you're going to be using. So this is uh, an example of a charge controller. So what's the charge controller? The charge controller takes the power from the panel and makes it usable by the battery, right? It reduces the variability of voltage and current 
provides a set voltage for the battery. And so this is the one that you'll use. This is what it looks like, um, you know, versus if having it on a diagram like this. This is useful for drawing it out, but then in real life, that translates into something like this, where these are your inputs. Um, and you gotta know which wire, what each of these inputs means, and which wires you want to wire in there, right? So if you go back to this drawing, they've actually labeled their charge controller in here. So they've got panel, plus minus, battery, plus minus, um, this might be, sometimes it's a temperature sensor, sometimes it's just an indicator light, um, plus minus, uh, and that translates to these terminals right here. You guys probably can't see it from far away, but um, there's a little picture of a module right there, and plus minus is what it says right on there. So the drawing directly translates to the terminal on the physical controller. So if I have that drawing and I need to know how to wire up that controller, I can look and I can know, okay, the wire that's in the drawing, that's module plus, put it right into that terminal on the controller. Um, here's another example of a drawing using the controller. Um, this is from the manual. So this tells you how this controller is meant to work. From the manual, um, it tells you, plug your PV module into these two terminals. Plug your battery into these two terminals. Um, plug you know, a load into these two terminals. In your case, um, be careful, uh, you want to plug your motor directly off the batteries and not off the load in the charge controller. This charge controller is made to be both the charge controller from the PV module to the battery and then to a load, to like a light bulb or something like that. You guys are using a bit more sophisticated setup where you can't run a motor off of the um, load terminals off that charge controller. You guys are running your motor directly off of your batteries using a motor controller in between there. So keep that in mind. But it gives you an idea of how to figure out how that um, battery works. So here's the manual. I downloaded it. It was pretty easy last night to find it. Um, I, like I said, I recommend looking through this stuff. So there's some really good information I wanted to point out in here. Um, you know, again, like right here, it tells you exactly what the different ports are. Um, PV terminals, four, battery terminals, five. So if you have any questions about how this is supposed to be hooked up, right here in the manual. Um, it actually, like I was just saying, it tells you, it explains the maximum power point tracking technology. So instead of sitting here listening to me drone on about it, you could just uh, you know read this little write-up here, and it explains what it does. Um, it's got that IV curve right there. So if you're interested in learning more about this stuff, this is a great resource. Um, it actually goes more in depth about how it charges a battery. So we didn't talk about this at all, but um, batteries have different ranges for where they're charging, and there's a whole science to batteries. Um, and this gives you a little introduction to what the MPPT, what the charge controller is doing when it's charging a battery, um, uh, and what the different bulk charging, constant charging, boost charging. So if you have an idea about these things, that can help you understand the best operating conditions for your cart in order to make it the most efficient, um, right? So if you, you might decide a certain, um, range of charging for your batteries is where you want it to be for when you're driving your cart. Um, and so you have them, you, you, you have that in mind for when your cart's operating. What, what are my batteries actually doing? What's my charge control? Is my charge controller trying to bulk charge my batteries right now instead of trying to power the motor? Well, that's going to be inefficient, right? You want your charge controller probably to be at a constant or float charging state so that most of the power is going from the batteries and the module to the motor instead of from the module to the batteries and, and messing it up, right? So think about how all these things are, are interacting. Um, it also has, um, it tells you about wire size. You know, if you, uh, this is a great resource if you're not sure about how to size your wires. This gives you an idea based on this charge controller 
um, what wire settings should be using. So again, um, you have these, these real physical components that have to work together with each other. I recommend um, understanding their uh, operating characteristics and uh, finding manuals, finding guidelines online. Um, so I also want to give you an introduction to the motor controller. So this is uh, what the motor controller looks like. Like I said before, what the motor controller does is it allows you to have some control over um, the amount of current that's going to go to the motor and, and thus the speed and uh, how fast um, so that you can, so that as soon as you turn it on, your wheels aren't spinning out and your motor's trying to go um, as, uh, as fast as possible or um, you can control that going around turns, that kind of thing, right? So you have a throttle that hooks into this motor controller. Uh, if you go online to where this motor controller is sold, uh, it's sold off of monsterscooterparts.com, it gives you a full description of how to hook each one of these up. So it kind of looks confusing. And before when we were talking about diagrams, we just had like a motor controller, like a block diagram of the motor controller and like positive minus, positive minus. Diagrams are great up to a point, tells you how things are gonna hook up, but it doesn't always tell you exactly when you get this mess of wires, what do I do with them? You can find that information. So, um, you know, it tells you, you probably can't read it, but it, it goes through the battery connector, um, which ones go to which, the motor connector, um, which color wires go to the motor, uh, which go to a brake connector, which go to a throttle. Um, one thing that's important on this um, it says, uh, that, uh, I'll, I'll read it out, that all scooter controllers require a switch joined to the lock connector on the controller wires in order to complete the electrical circuit. So there's a part of this, and if I go back to this diagram, um, you can see that they've actually joined these two together. There's a circuit that's complete here. Um, we don't, I haven't talked about that at all, but if you read through how the controller works, it says there's a switch where you have to wire the terminals together to complete a circuit for it to operate. So you gotta kind of pay attention to how do I get this thing to work. If you, you know, didn't read that, didn't realize that you had to short those two together to wire those two together, and the controller isn't working, your cart's not working, um, you might not know what's wrong, why it's not working. Um, uh, there's a picture of your throttle that you're going to use. So again, if you're uh, new, I want to introduce you to all these uh, components. Um, sold from the same website, uh, Monster Scooter Parts. Uh, I believe they're using the same ones these year, this year. Um, but when you get yours, try and find, if it's, not, if it's different than these, try and find the specific information about it. Um, but it's got the wires, and if you go to the website, it tells you how to hook each of these three wires up to which um, wires on that controller. And then you don't have to do, all you have to do is follow the instructions, hook it in, and it should be, should work for you. Um, and I'll actually, before I do this, I did want to show you. So, um, so this is just, you know, I, you find that website uh, where it's sold. It tells you the features, tells you what voltage it operates at, um, tells you the wattage, and in this description. So there's no actual manual for this that I could find. Maybe you could find one. Maybe you could find um, descriptions online of where someone else has used this in their own build. And those can be great resources too, right? Just doing a little bit of research. But uh, and this is just um, that description of how, how it's hooked together. Um, same thing with the throttle. Um, says, you know, use it on 24 volt to 36 volt systems. So good, works with our system. Um, electric scooter throttle wiring details. Red to red, black to black, white to blue. So that white to blue might have been confusing if you didn't actually come together. There are some, some little gotchas that sometimes things don't exactly work together uh, as you might expect. And so just reading, finding some instructions can be very, very useful. Uh, 
And so uh, we'll end by talking about the watt meters. Um, the watt meters are one of the, um, we get a lot of questions about the watt meters. Um, we've only been part of the competition for a couple of years. Um, what the watt meters do is, like I said, they measure the power flowing through whatever part of the circuit they're hooked up to. So you hook up the watt meter right next to your solar panel, you'll get a good idea of um, the power coming out of your solar panel going into your charge controller. So that could be useful for you if you want to, you know, test out how the solar panel works. Hook up the watt meter, um, ch start charging your batteries, and then shade the panel, and then take the shade off. And you'll see the differences on this of the power flowing through there. Um, the watt meter gives you an instantaneous power, and it also gives you an energy. So you zero out that energy, and it'll start the clock, like it'll start ticking. And then as your power changes kind of instantaneously, that energy will, will rise over time. So how we use this in the competition is that we zero out this or, or we find where you start in terms of energy at the beginning of the race. And then we measure where you end in terms of energy at the end of the race. And so we see how much energy you got from your panel throughout the course of the race. Um, and uh, then we see how much energy went to your motor throughout the course of the race. Um, and you know how much energy you got from your panel versus how much energy you pushed through to your motor gives you an idea of your efficiency of your, of your system. Um, th so that's what the watt meters do. They also give you, you know, your voltage and current. So they can be super useful in terms of um, measuring the way that your cart system is operating, giving you ideas, making sure that you're actually getting power flow from your module. You're actually getting power flow to the motor. Um, we don't specifically, as far as I know, say where to put the watt meters in your system for the final design. Um, I think there's a there's a, a way that's um, probably the the goal, which is to to get the basically a comparison of how much energy is being going into your system from your uh, module and how much energy is going into the motor. So that gives you an idea of probably where you should try and think about putting your watt meters. Um, but you know, you, the, the point is, is that for you guys, be intentional in your design. You know, you know how all these things are operating together. If you know your voltages, you know your currents, um, you can ask yourself, why do I need a watt meter? And where should it go to accomplish that purpose, right? So, so make your choices based on specific reasons that will be best for making your cart operate most efficiently. Um, so one question is like, where should the watt meter go? Maybe for the, um, the challenge, maybe for the race, you want your watt meters to be at your solar panel and at your motor. But maybe for your testing, you want your watt meters to be um, outside of, on the other side of your charge controller to make sure that it, like f at your PV model on your charge controller, which will make sure that the power coming from your module going into the charge controller is the same that's coming out of the charge controller. So you might want to see how efficient that charge controller is, right? Maybe you want to see how efficient your um, motor controller is by measuring the power coming in from the batteries to the motor controller and then exiting the motor controller going to the motor. So you might put the watt meters on either side of that. So you can use that as a tool in testing to find out where in your um, system you have inefficiencies to, to make sure that power is flowing in the system the way that you intended it to in your design. Um, and then, like I said, for competition, you might want them um, at either end. So you can measure the power coming in from the modules and then power exiting to the, to the motor. Um, and again, if you look up um, the watt meter, it gives you a description of how to wire. So we get a lot of questions about how to wire in um, your watt meter, and I'll see if this doesn't get too blurry. It's not too bad. Um, How, we get a lot of questions about how to wire in the watt meter. This is probably the hardest 
um, component to wire into the system, um, and ones where if you wire it wrong, you can actually end up um, busting things pretty easily. Um, but if you go through the diligence of looking up each of your components, um, you'd find this website where it's sold from, uh, and it gives you a diagram of how to wire that in. So the watt meter includes a uh, um, the, the, watt, the meter itself, the display, and it includes a shunt. Um, and those two work together to measure current and voltage. And when you know your current and voltage, you can find your power, you can find your energy, if you measure time also. Um, and it gives you the, the steps. So first, connect the shunt to the negative side of power. You want to be certain to follow all those, um, those, those instructions and connect it to the negative side. Uh, and then you hook the meter up to the shunt and your positive end, just like this diagram describes, and uh, you should have a working meter. Um, what it does is uh, you've got you know, your power source and your load. So depending on where in the system you're talking about, um, your power source and your load for the meter might be different, right? If I have my watt meter between my module and my charge controller, my power source is my meter. My load in that sense is the charge controller and kind of everything downstream of it. Um, because I want to measure the, the power going from my module to the rest of the system. So the rest of the system is the load. My power is my module. If I put the watt meter between the battery and the motor controller, my power is then the whole system that's the, mo that the, the module, the charge controller, and the battery. And then my load is my motor controller and my motor. Right? So this can fit kind of anywhere in the system if you think of these components as as different parts, right? So the, 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 the DC power and the load can take on different meanings depending on where you put the watt meter in your system. But essentially what it does is um, it measures the current flow across that shunt um, using these three um, wires. And then um, it measures, or it's probably actually using these two wires, I imagine. Uh, and it's probably using the blue and the red to measure voltage across your source. So that, then that's, that's two pieces of information, right? There's voltage um, from either side of the circuit and then current across there. And that's how it's getting um, its power reading. Just taking the product of those. It's its energy reading by taking at each time step the power and um, summing that up to get the energy reading. Um, so that's how you hook in your watt meter. Um, that is most of the presentation I have on the components. Uh, do I, does anybody have any questions? Anything I should go over again? Anything else? Yeah. Is there any pros or cons to using like thicker wires versus thinner wires? Um, not really. In your sense, it, it's going to be harder to work with. It's going to be heavier. So at a certain point, you know, a lighter cart is going to be more efficient. Um, so uh, your wires, they do get a little heavier. It's probably not going to make that big of a difference in your case. Um, uh, it, you might get to a point where the terminals, say in your uh, your charge controller, are too small for the wires. So you want to make sure that the wires, the wires themselves fit with again that idea of the interoperability between things. Make sure that the wire sizes fit with the charge controller. That charge controller probably has a range for those terminals of say, it's probably like 12 gauge to 6 gauge or something like that, um, in, in terms of the wires that will accept into that terminal. So Think about those things, um, but in general, you're not going to lose anything. You're going to have a minimum wire size based on the current flowing through there. Um, otherwise, if the wire's too small, you'll start limiting your current, and the wires will get too hot, and they'll get inefficient. So your maximum wire size is probably going to be based on the components and what the terminals accept. Anything else? Um, I have a couple more pictures of diagrams. Um, if anybody wasn't in the, uh, the, the one this morning and just wanted to see more examples of, of people um, diagramming stuff. So here's one of uh, putting everything together. This is from um, uh, someone online who had done a go-kart that was similar to this. And they made this design and it's actually like 
super detailed about, they actually have like the connectors in here um, for the motor, the throttle, going to the motor controller. But again, um, you know, translating the physical component to the, the diagram. Um, you can start putting that all together so that you know exactly how things connect um, by a combination of making your diagram, reading the manuals, um, making an intentional plan, being intentional about your design, knowing what voltages, what currents things operate at. Um, so just for your you know, education, here's a couple more examples of designs, um, diagrams from uh, systems in past years. Yeah. Uh, when we were talking about the locks, I didn't really catch in uh, what a shunt was. So the shunt is um, this piece here. Um, and basically what it does is it, it, it just allows current to flow through there. Um, it should have so little resistance that it doesn't affect your circuit, right? It's not going to limit the current in your circuit, but it's a specific amount of resistance that the watt meter knows. So the watt meter can actually measure the small differences in voltage at either end of this and tell what the current is because the watt meter knows exactly what that is. So you have to use that shunt in conjunction with that watt meter or else your <coughs> reading is going to be um, all is not going to be correct. Or if you make any modifications to that shunt, your reading is not going to be correct because then you change the resistance characteristic of that shunt and the watt meter is thinking that it's one thing when it's actually another and you're not going to have correct reading. So it's got to be hooked up in this way um, and hooked up to these terminals because they're all calibrated and made together so that that watt meter can read a current off of that shunt. And so the shunt is just a piece that allows the current to flow through the circuit as if that was a wire, but that the watt meter can use to, to read the current. Does that answer your question? Cool. Um, so yeah, just some, some more here as, as we end. Um, I'll let you go in like two minutes, um, just to get an idea of different examples of, of diagramming, um, nice straight lines, color coding the different sizes, uh, the different positive and negative circuits. Um, you can see the... Um, nice jump there so that you know that these wires are not connecting. Um, gives you an idea of what the wire gauge is. Um, this one's not quite as nice. You can see this is drawn by a nice, if you're not going to do it on a computer, draw on a, use a nice ruler edge. Um, this one sees, probably wasn't used by a ruler. Someone had a pretty steady hand, but a ruler would have been better. Um, make it more clear. Color coding would help this be more clear. Um, you do get graded on, um, and it goes into the final score on your diagrams, your electrical diagrams. So you want them to be clear, you want them to follow conventions. Basically what you want is, I mean in practical terms, you want the person doing the design and the diagramming to be able to hand that off to someone doing the build, and they can build it to exactly how you intended it, right? You want the, the design, the diagram should translate your intentions to the builder. Um, for the competition, what you want is that the graders understand your design, think that it's clear, concise, follows conventions, and that you've included all the, the um, components. Um, this one's uh, made on a computer, probably something like um, PowerPoint. There's, there's other programs. There's like really in-depth circuit design programs that you can get that do a lot of this stuff for you. Um, there's ones online. There's... there's um, programs that you can download that have symbols in there and stuff. There's a higher learning curve for those, but you can get a really nice clear design out of them. Most of these are done probably with like PowerPoint or Word, which is fine, as long as you make it clear. This one, uh, you know, an example of something that's a lot more confusing. There's, uh, hor there's diagonal lines, um, they're crisscrossing. You don't know when things are supposed to be connected to each other or when they're just two wires running over that aren't connected. So avoid something like this. And that's all I got for you guys. Any other questions? No? All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate your attention.